Welcome to Fortune Forecast. You are in my book playlist where we are going through the book titled The Master Secret, written by Albert Boynton Storms in 1913. It was published by Jennings and Graham and it is in the public domain. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And to my fortune community, welcome back. My takeaway from the previous chapter reminded me of the quote from the Star Wars movies where Darth Vader goes on to say you have paid the price for your lack of vision and so kind of reminds me that yes without vision we we have no direction sometimes this is sometimes why i believe that fathers when they're trying to pass on their business to their children if that vision is not sold if that vision isn't 100 percent, if there isn't a conviction in who this business is being passed on to the this is probably why some businesses fail when it goes on to the next generation and so forth. The vision is not the same. So I'm not going to sit and talk much about that. I know that the angle of the author was very heavy religious overtone. For me, I am able to kind of uh, put it through my colander and extract the best point. And to me, that was the best point that we do need to have vision. In an interesting way, the author did mention that going in within and those wee hours of the morning when everything is still so pristine that you can have that solitude and within you may be able as you get closer to the silence you may be able to commune with God these are my words not his I'm just kind of I picked it up <laughs> that's what I picked up and and so I believe that that we can hear God's voice giving us direction and then we can have clear vision. I'm sure you've had those moments. You might call them epiphany, you know, or that's something just makes so much sense. It's so clear and, and that you don't question and you move forward because it's just so clear, crystal clear, almost like what I think that Nikola Tesla, when he said he used to see visions of his inventions, could be something like that, right? Anyway, let's move on to the next section titled An Ancient Psalm of Life. The 90th Psalm, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the light, thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it is flourisheth, and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed in thy anger, and in thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our inquiries before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We bring our years to an end as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten or even by reason of strength, fourscore years. Yet is their pride but labor and sorrow, for it is soon gone, and we fly away. We knoweth the power of thine anger, and thy wrath according to the fear that is due unto thee. So teach us to number our days, that we may get us an heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us in the morning with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory upon their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yeah, the work of our hands, establish thou it. No ear 
that has ever been attuned to the noblest music can fail to be charmed by the transcendent beauty of this closing stanza of an immortal poem. It is the utterance of an old man, not grown garrulous, but grand with the years. One who has passed through the vicissitudes of a noble career, a mastermind of two religions and two civilizations who was summoned to great leadership by the direct command of God, whom he met face to face by the burning bush and in the solitudes of Sinai. The 90th Psalm has come down to us through the centuries as the deepest heart utterance of Moses, the man of God. Out from these sublime solitudes of the mountain and the soul, this man came forth with a moral grandeur of character and a spiritual vision that made him not merely the prophet and lawgiver of Israel, but the universal seer. There are men who stamp the die of their souls upon the thoughts of power that live on through history and whose personalities must be reckoned with as the most potent of the world forces that construct civilizations and religions. Such a man was Moses. Though the chroniclers had added volume to volume of the deeds of this man of God, it would have compensated but ill for the loss of this brief psalm which gathers up his philosophy and deep-souled faith. The great soul utterance of Moses is here. Sometimes a great man has waited for the centuries to mature an appreciation of his character, until at last some poet or artist has arisen with genius to paint him in rugged grandeur and transcendent beauty till all men see the greatness of his character. Thus, St. Gaudens has chiseled the Puritan, and thus Hoffman has painted the Christ, and thus Angelo conceived the greatness of Moses' character and chiseled it in marble. None who has ever looked upon Angelo's Moses can fail to have received a lasting impression of the ethical exaltation and strength, the intellectual power, the spiritual grandeur of this man of God. But it seems to me that this noble and spiritual conception of the character of Moses is more largely derived from the revelation which this psalm contains than from all the record of his life and deeds. To be sure, the psalm would not be sufficient in itself, but standing out against the background of the deeds and the words of the man, it constitutes the spiritual flower of the revelation of his character. Under the pressure and the discipline of great responsibilities, great characters are formed. It was under the stress and strain of the deathless and grim struggle for freedom that William of Orange grew into the princely and patient leader. It was through the unspeakable sorrow of a great people, the moral struggle of a nation, the pathos of suffering with all could pity but none could stay, that Lincoln grew to the intellectual and moral grandeur and made possible and inevitable his historical designation as the savior of his country. Moses was potentially great when he turned his back on the court of Pharaoh, despising the luxuries of an Egyptian palace in comparison with the excellence of a spiritual inheritance with his own race. It was this initial excellence of character that called forth the eulogy of the book of Hebrews. Choosing rather to be evil and treated with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, dwell with me for a moment upon this wondrous psalm. Quote, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou house formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. End quote. These utterances stand nobly by the side of the first word of the sacred scriptures. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It marks the distinguishing characteristic of the Bible. It lifts and defines in one great word the conception of the personality of God that overarches all uplifting and hopeful religious faith. Quote, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. End quote. 
We can imagine Moses turning back in retrospect over the 40 dreary but significant years of the wilderness journey. A time of moral discipline when these Hebrew people learned the stern lesson that God is in earnest and that he stands for moral worth, intellectual sincerity, and sterling achievement. That God is the eternal, that his purposes persist, that men perish either in judgment or in frailty, but that, quote, through the ages one increasing purpose runs, and the thoughts of men are widened with the process of the sons. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed in thine anger, and in thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We bring our years to an end as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, or even by reason of strength fourscore years. Yet is their pride but labor and sorrow, for it is soon gone and we fly away. End quote. It is no matter of surprise when we enter deeply into sympathy with Moses that he should have expressed the feeling of awe at the evident judgments of God. And yet it is not the craven fear of a groping ignorance, appalled at the calamities and sorrows of life, but the utterance of a man who can stand forth in moral and spiritual dignity, and in the faith that there is a divine wisdom and mercy at the heart of the dark mysteries of life. Quote, who knoweth the power of thine anger and thy wrath according to the fear that is due unto thee? So teach us the, to number our days, that we may get us an heart of wisdom. End quote. These considerations lead the man of God to a prayer of penitence and of supplication. Quote, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us in the morning with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. End quote. And then follows the magnificent optimism, the outlook of faith, the spiritual mastery over life of these words of our psalm. Quote, Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory upon their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yeah, the work of our hands, establish thou it. End quote. The work and the glory and the beauty of God to be revealed to his children, and the establishment of their work and glory and beauty, like unto his glory and beauty. This is Moses' prayer the work of God. This word, work, is fundamental in our speech. The root of this word, as well as the energy of its thought, gives vigor to the speech of all Germanic and Saxon peoples. It is worken in German. It is the synonym of the Greek root energos, whence we derive the word energy. The work of God means the energizing of God. Note how Moses came to recognize the fact that God energizes our works, that God is actively interested in the affairs of the world and of men, that God has purposes and plans. This vigorous and clear conception by Moses was no doubt the effect of the study of the religion of his people. The Hebrews had this characteristic excellence in all their education. They thoroughly drilled into their youth a reverent appreciation of the traditional heroes of the race, and these traditional heroes brought into bold relief the qualities of characteristics moral and spiritual strength. 
their scriptures held, the treasures of spiritual conception that have made them the richest inheritance of the human race. Thus, we have in Paul's letters to Timothy a picture of the youth in characteristic Hebrew fashion learning the scriptures at his mother's knee. And thus we have the treasured picture of the Christ at the age of 12 drawing near to the holy city and its temple with the spiritual exaltation that always thrills us with wonder as we reread the narration. Thus the group at Bethlehem at the time of the Nativity are filled with thoughts of God and of His great and gracious purpose for the race, and their prayers took shape in the language of the great prophets and psalmists. And thus Moses, at his mother's knee, was taught the religion of his people until he saw the incomparable excellence and worth of his spiritual inheritance by birth. It suggests to us a lesson that this age sorely needs the priceless value of traditional faith. We have made such astonishing advancement in material ways and in political achievements and transition in thought conceptions of life and of human destiny have been so rapid, and the mold in which faith shall cast its creeds have been broken and abandoned and formed anew with such facility that we are in the gravest danger of putting a cheap estimate upon the priceless treasures of traditional faith. I have lived in the country. I have lived in the heart of the great city. I have lived in the midst of university and college life. I have lived in the midst of the modern commercial world. I have felt the stress and strain to which men are subject in the university and on the board of trade, on the farm and in the factory, and I am ready to say that there is nothing of such supreme value to us as a people and as individuals as the deep religious faith of our fathers. In the crucial periods of our national history, we have felt the saving strength of this faith, faith in God, and belief in His purposes, and trust His righteousness and conviction of duty. In the home of our people, religion has had a queenly place. Hardship and poverty, disappointment and death have all been met and overcome in the spirit of patience and of victorious hope. Men's souls have withstood the grinding contact of the world with its eager enterprise and often seeming contempt for the spiritual. The family Bible and the family altar, the church and the school have kept alive in men's souls ideals of purity and of duty and have cherished a spirit of gentleness and of righteousness that have kept open the springs of purest inspiration and of earnest endeavor. It is out from such homes that God has called earnest and successful workers in the world's great enterprises. From such homes have come statesmen who could construct political institutions that should endure because built in righteousness and in wisdom. It is out from such homes that men have come with a lofty spirit of devotion to answer the call of the state and of the school and of the church for high and holy service. It is in such homes that the call to the Christian ministry has been heard and the incentive to an education has been felt. When given an opportunity to know the beauty and the power of the incentives which spring from spiritual ideals and religious faith, young men and women have scorned being merely mercenary or frivolously selfish. The people who have lived near God and have cherished belief in the divine providence and in divine purpose have, by their faith, thrown a glory over life and relieved its hardness. It is by faith that men and women have been made patient and able to endure as seeing Him who is invisible. It has been my rich privilege to know many such homes as these of which I speak and to see come out from them the young men and women of purity of life of lofty aspirations and of earnest purposes that augur well for the constructive work and the spiritual achievements of the future. I am convinced that the blight of heart atheism would be the most fatal that could fall upon us. 
A blight upon the fields might leave us hungry. A plague among the cattle and swine might leave us poor. But out from such hunger and such poverty we might come cleaner and stronger for the future. But a blight upon the soul, although the harvest should remain rich and the cattle multiply upon a thousand hills, would leave us unspeakably wretched and miserably poor. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The conviction which grew upon Moses and the Hebrew people, the conviction of the moral earnestness of God, is of as fundamental importance to the stability of our civilization as it was to the nationality of the Hebrews. This age of science and the marvelous material achievement needs nothing so much as clear spiritual vision and a genuine and earnest faith. This conviction and this faith were wrought in Moses and in the Hebrew people by the stern discipline of the wilderness. Looking back upon it, Moses said, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. God sloughs off the work of men when extraneous to his purpose. The wicked are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Men do not achieve enduring results save as they build in harmony with God's ideals. If we were standing today in the Westminster Abbey, we should be impressed with two things. First, as to the engineering fidelity of the builders of this noble temple. They wrought in accordance with the plans and the specifications of the infinite. Engineering is nothing more nor less than an apprenticeship in the drafting rooms of the Creator. And so these walls stand stench and beautiful because they conform with more or less fidelity to the plans of the chief engineer. But back of its engineering fidelity, you would be impressed with its religious and spiritual validity. It is a temple for worship. It represents and epitomizes the spiritual life of a great people and victorious race. Within its walls rests the dust of Britain's most illustrious sons. Here the generations have continuity. Here is fitly symbolized the ethical and spiritual faith of the nation. And so the temple stands worthily in the metropolis of the kingdom with perennial and noble significance. But if it were only a pile of stone and of mortar, if it had no ideals breathing life and beauty upon it, it would be of no more value than any other stone pile. After much else has been forgotten, much of incident and of passion of the fearful civil strife that rent our country for four long years, the memory of Lincoln in humble prayer before God, with deepest agony of soul for his country, and yet calm by the sustaining power of a sublime faith, will be sketched upon the page of our national history. If there is anything that shall endure through the centuries from the constructive work of these past years, it will be because men have built in harmony with the purposes of God. I'm going to do a sidebar because the author has a note that I would like to go ahead and share with you. In the life of Governor Andrew of Massachusetts, an incident is given which throws light upon the secret of reserved strength in Lincoln's character and the religious quality of the patriotism of his stench supporters. It was in the summer of 1862 when emancipation was being talked a great deal. One day Governor Andrew sent for Edward W. Kingsley and greeted him with the blunt words, How do you do? I want you to go to Washington. Mr. Kingsley replied, Why, Governor, said I, I can't go to Washington on any such notice as this. I am busy and it is impossible for me to go. All my folks are serving their country, said he. And he mentioned the various services the members of his staff were engaged in and said with emphasis, somebody must go to Washington. I command you to go. Well, said I, Governor, put it in that way and I shall go, of course. There is something going on, he remarked. This is a momentous time. 
He turned suddenly toward me and said, You believe in prayer, don't you? I said, Why, of course. Then let us pray. And he knelt right down at the chair that was placed there. We both kneeled down, and I never heard such a prayer in all my life. I never was so near to the throne of God except when my mother died as I was then. I said to the governor, I will start this afternoon for Washington. I soon found out that emancipation was in everybody's mouth, and when I got to Washington and called upon Summer, he began to talk emancipation. He asked me to go and see the president and tell him how the people of Boston and New England regarded it. I went to the White House that evening and met the president. We first talked about everything but emancipation, and finally he asked me what I thought about emancipation. I told him what I thought about it and said that Governor Andrew was so far interested in it that I had no doubt he had sent me there to post the president in regard to what the class of people I met in Boston and New York thought of it. And then I repeated to him, as I shall previously to summer, this prayer of the governor as well as I could remember it. The president said, when we have the governor of Massachusetts to send us troops in the way he has, and when we have him to utter such prayers for us, I have no doubt that we shall succeed. Pearson's Life of John A. Andrew, Volume 2, page 47. There is in this prayer of Moses a petition for an awakening capacity. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and they glory unto their children. It seems that Moses himself needed to be startled into an appreciation of the divine presence, as at the burning bush, and again disciplined through forty long years in the mountain silences to the capacity or power of listening to the divine voice that should summon him to great tasks and high duty. And the people under his leadership needed also the long discipline of the wilderness before they acquired the spiritual education to cooperate with the divine purposes. There is appalling moral waste in the world. Waste because men work at cross purposes with God and their work comes to naught. And men work at cross purposes with God either through willfulness or ignorance. Through willfulness when, like undisciplined children, they fancy their own way and will to be better than God's way and God's will. And through ignorance from lack of spiritual vision and spiritual faith, they become little and provincial in the great universe of God. Talleyrand was dining with Wellington when word came that Napoleon was dead. What an event, they all cried. "'Tis no event,' said Talleyrand. "'Tis but a piece of news.' And Talleyrand was right. Napoleon's genius was prostituted to a selfish ambition. He is memorable in the history because of the temporary disturbance which he made among the powers of Europe, because of his colossal schemes, because of his military genius, and because, through him, multitudes perished in battle, because he impoverished a nation. France has never yet recovered from the waste and the exhaustion of the Napoleonic regime. Grant would not visit the tomb of Napoleon, such was his repugnance and righteous indignation at the character and the career of the Corsican. Napoleon must be recorded in history as a mere provincial. His work does not endure. Moreover, besides the necessity of working in harmony with God, if man's work shall endure, there is the necessity for sincere and genuine and pure character if men would thus be treasured in memory along with the good causes which they have advocated. Gladstone is quoted by Morley as saying of Parnell and of Parnell's brazenness in the face of the exposure of his personal impurity that Parnell represented the unruffled continuity of stained leadership and through the moral judgment of the people of England and of Ireland, Parnell has been branded and was obliged at last to retire ignobly. Browning, in the Paracelsus, speaks of one upon whom the moral judgment of God was wrought like this, quote, No mean trick he left untried, and truly well-nigh wormed, 
all traces of God's finger out of him, then died grown old. End quote. And in Browning's verse, such an one is contrasted with another who, quote, never turned his back, but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed the right were worsted, wrong would triumph. Hold we fall to rise, are baffled to fight better, sleep to wake. End quote. To such faith and such optimism, those alone have right who put themselves in tune with the infinite. Longfellow makes Angelo say to a detractor, quote, He says I show mankind that I am wanting in piety and religion, in proportion as I profess perfection in my art. Profess perfection? Why, tis only men like Bugiardini who are satisfied with what they do. I never am content, but always see the labors of my hand fall short of my conception. End quote. And to have held the ideal, and to have been patiently devoted, and not to have debased the conceptions of the soul, this, at last, is the final reward. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. End quote. End of section, titled, An Ancient Psalm of Life. Wow. All right. Can't wait to share my ideas and thoughts on this. Let's go on to the next video. If you haven't done so, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and head over to the next video where I will be there with the next chapter.